today. Um, so I'm happy to have him with you. Thank you. Who is going to be speaking on normal cycles and the curvature of the Thank you very much. This reminds me of my first serious talk. I was a grad student and my advisor arranged how I speak at this conference in Canada, had a 20 minute speech and said this will make a name, will make a name for yourself. It could be for good or for bad. Let's work so it's make, you make a good, good reputation. Now this is going to go on the web so fortunately there are not so many people out there to witness my embarrassment. So <laughs> this is the plan. Um, uh, so I'll start with some classical uh, stuff. It goes back to the 1920s. But first I need to introduce some, some notations and, and terminology. So there's going to be an ambient space, V. It's Euclidean space, and it has capital N dimension. And there's a so Euclidean. The metric is denoted by this. Uh, there's, an, there's a pairing between a dual and a space. C is a linear functional, V is a vector, and it gives me C paired of V, the value of C on, on V. Now, the, the, metric, uh, the metric defines uh, some isomorphisms. As co classically, they're called raising the indices, and the inverse is called lowering the, the indices. Excuse me. So I will, I will use these, these notations. Now, there's a, I will think of V star tensor V, I'll identify with a cotangent bundle of V. And uh, as such, it has a canonical one form. I won't give you the invariant definition because it's just too, not very intuitive. So here's the uh, definition coordinates. If we choose uh, Euclidean coordinates in V, we get uh, dual coordinates on the V star, and alpha is going to be some Ci dxi. Okay. And we have a symplectic form, which is d alpha, it's some C, d xi wedge d xi. Okay. Now, there's an orientation uh, that's induced. It's a bit funny, it's not typically the orientation that um, mathematicians use this as the orientation the physicists use. So, orient V star times V using this form, dx1 wedge dxn wedge dx1 wedge dxn. So that's going to be the, the orientation. So, the, the, the first appearance of the conormal cycle, well, is the conormal bundle of a sum manifold. So if I have a sum manifold, a smooth sum manifold in a V, uh, the conormal bundle, well, it consists, the total space consists of pairs C, X, with the property that the restriction of uh, the linear functional to the tangent space of x is zero. And uh, this clearly projects onto x. Okay. And um, uh, that's. We have dually the normal bundle. Using the metric isomorphism, we have the normal bundle. Let me write this down here. The normal bundle 
to x and v is going to consist of pairs v x with the property that v perpendicular to the tangent space of x. Good. Uh, now, uh, we, have, we have this fact, it's a proposition, um, T star x v, so the conormal bundle uh, sitting, in, sitting in the tangent bundle of v is an exact Lagrangian. Uh, meaning the restriction of alpha to the space is zero, and an orientation on V induces orientation on the conormal bundle. And how do you see this? Uh, going back to the normal bundle, there's a normal exponential map that identifies a neighborhood of x in the normal bundle to a neighborhood of x in v. And that neighborhood of x in v carries an orientation, and you're done. Notice, x is not, not assumed to be orientable. However, the conormal bundle uh, carries a natural orientation. So from now on, I'll assume that carries an orientation, so it's an oriented Euclidean space. Um, notice, if I denote by uh, S T star X V, the unit conormal, uh, the unit sphere of the conormal bundle, the restriction, the restriction of alpha to, to this is going to be uh, zero. And um, uh, it shows, let me, okay, and let me mention this, SV star cross V, the unit sphere in uh, V star cross V, which is the same as the unit sphere bundle, a cotangent bundle. This is a contact manifold with respect to the, con with the with respect to one form with respect to one form uh, alpha, it has dimension 2n minus 1. This has dimension n minus 1. And the restriction uh, of alpha to this is uh, 0, which shows that the unit conormal bundle is a Legendrian Submanifold in the unit cotangent bundle. Okay, so we have we have this story. Uh, good. Now I'll, I'll say this in words. The uh, Conormal bundle is obtained from the unit normal bundle by a coning construction. And I, I'm not going to insist too much. You, you're coning starting at a zero section. Yeah? You can see the formulas in here. There's, there's a map. Uh, there's a map. Oh, sorry. Uh, it's a cone map. Uh, and, I mean, you're coning. I don't want to say more. I will talk about this more when, and in greater details when we go to singular sets. Now, these, uh, uh, the conormal bundle has some nice, uh, interacts nicely with the, the Morse theory on, um, on um, X. So let me let me explain that. 
So we start, we start with a sum manifold in the smooth compact. And we start, we have a sm smooth function in the ambient space. Uh, and we can form its graph. So and it's well known, it is well known uh, that this is the Lagrangian sum manifold in the cotangent uh, in the cotangent bundle. And obviously there's a diffeomorphism, the projection from the, the graph to V is a diffeomorphism. So in particular, the graph of the differential uh, uh, has a natural orientation. It just pulled back from the orientation from V. So here we have an oriented Lagrangian. And we have another oriented Lagrangian. And the intersection theory of these two mimics uh, a little bit of the Morse theory. So let me state a result. I mean, I think this was known by many people. It's not, it, it's elementary. I found it in the, some notes of McPherson. And by the way, in this business, there are many orientation conve uh, conventions. It could be a nightmare. So I stuck with McPherson conventions. That's why I picked the orientation of the cotangent bundle that way. And that's why you're going to see some funny stuff. OK, so a proposition. Let's suppose that I have a point, P, Cx, which is an cotangent conormal bundle of x and in the graph of minus df. I, we work with this because it minimizes the number of signs. It's just it, we introduce a sign uh, and then you kill other negative signs in some other places. OK? And um, first, uh, and I'll say it in words and you can read it there. Uh, the graph of the differential intersects the conormal bundle transversely at P if and only if the point X is a non-degenerate critical point of uh, F restricted to X. Okay? So um, being a critical point of F is the same as being a critical point of minus F. Also, the intersection number, the local intersection number, if I have transversality, the local intersection number of these things at P, so we'll call it the local intersection number, is minus 1 times the Morse index of F at X. And in particular, if you uh, use poincare hoff you deduce that the intersection number of these two uh, Lagrangians, notice the one is compact and one is non-compact, but in the right way. The intersection number of these two Lagrangians is the Euler characteristic of the manifold X. Good. Now, a special case. Because th this will, this will play an important role in the in the, in the future. We have on a vector space we have a natural collection of smooth functions, the linear functions, and this collection of smooth functions will will be very important in a second. So, in this case, if I have, if I have. C, a linear function, uh, 
probably I should use the bigger one. If xi is a linear function, uh, then the graph of d xi is going to be really a plane in v star across Okay, so it's, it's a really flat Lagrangian. And um, what do we have? The intersection number of the conormal bundle of x with the graph of uh, uh, minus c at a point p is minus 1, the index of the restriction of C to x. x. So although this function is trivial, is trivial when uh, looked on, on the ambient space, its restriction, its restriction uh, is um, um, non-trivial on x. And let me just say something. If you give me any finite dimensional vector space of functions, of smooth functions on a manifold, I can embed a manifold in a vector space so these functions become linear. Just take an embedding, we know it exists, and then embed it, use this function to further embed in the bigger space. Okay. So, uh, working with manifolds uh, as embedded manifolds is not a big restriction, but there are going to be issues, some of which I, I, I wasn't able to, to settle. All in good time. Good. So, now, vial tube formula. I like this formula very much. It's, it's a really beautiful, it's a really beautiful result. So, uh, let me go through this in, um, carefully. So we start with x, a compact sum manifold in, in uh, V. I'll write dimension of x is m. And C is the co-dimension. Okay, C is the co-dimension of the manifold. And now we form a tube, the tube of radius R around X, consists of all points V and V, so that the distance from, from V to the submanifold X is at most R. Okay, that's the tube of radius r. Now, if r is small, this tube can be identified topologically with um, uh, radius r disk bundle in the normal bundle, just by the exponential map. Because uh, if you're not too far from the sum manifold x, there's a unique closest point, and it just follows, well, you know that. And the vial tube formula tells us what is the volume of this tube for small r. Okay? So I will not give you the proof, but I'll give you the main steps in the proof to see where the normal bundle comes in. Okay. I mean, the main steps are simple. Just I've left the hard part <laughs> at the end. It's hidden. So how do we compute? How do we compute uh, the volume? Well, we have an exponential map, a uh, normal exponential map. Let me call it from zero infinity cross unit normal bundle of x into 
v, let me make sure I get this right, exponential tvx is going to be x plus tv. So you start at a point x on the manifold and you travel in direction v, that's a unit direction, for t seconds. Okay, that's the exponential. The geodesics in V are straight lines. Okay, and um, we have omega V. It's the volume form on uh, volume form on V. So it's dx1 wedge dxn. Why do I have a volume form? We have a metric and we have an orientation on V. So. Uh, this exponential map is a diffeomorphism from 0R closed to the tube, to the tube, excuse me, around x, well, and I remove x, but it doesn't matter, it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't hurt the volume. So, uh, we have that the volume of the tube is going to be integral 0r cross uh, s dx v pullback by the exponential of the omega form on v. That's what the volume is. Yeah, here it is. Sorry, I, I think I, you see the shadow. That's the formula. And what we need to understand is this form, the pullback. Okay, so I will, I want to, I want to, to do this computations. And I, in fact, why don't I just point towards towards what, what's written. So, uh, oh, excuse me. There's an issue with the, the screening. OK. So upon pullback, I mean, really, that's the pullback. I group in terms of powers of t. I group in per, I write it as a polynomial in t. The top degree, well, the top degree gives me the volume form on uh, the uh, on v star. But when you restrict it to the unit sphere bundle, it's going to get zero because it's just too big, too big. It's just. It, it, this is form of, in terms of variable only in the normal directions, and when you restrict to the normal uh, normal sphere at, at a point, it's going to be zero. So this this term disappears. The other ones I grouped in that form, and kappa i are forms on the unit normal bundle of V, and uh, I, the, the, the I tells you what is the degree in the monomials of uh, dx1, dxn. Okay. So that's how we group them. These forms kappa I will be very important. That's why I go slowly. So when we compute, well, we do a Fubini. Uh, you get, when we integrate with respect to r, we get that power of, uh, of uh, r. And um, now, I have artificially introduced this term omega n i. This is omega m denotes the, the volume of the m-dimensional ball. And I've divided it here, so I haven't changed anything. But this just happens to be the area of the sphere of this dimension. Okay. So I get what I what I get is a, a polynomial 
I mean, notice this term, omega n minus i and r to the power n minus i, is the volume of the ball of dimension n minus i and radius r. And there's this coefficient in there, which we'll, we'll see in a second. So we get this formula, we get this formula for, uh, we get this formula for the volume of the tube. So it's a polynomial. Here we have, I, I, I'm, I'm just changing the variables. Uh, notice the degree, the lowest degree, the lowest term of this polynomial is to the co-dimension, and it goes all the way up to the dimension of uh, the ambient space. So it, it looks like something times, let me just say, I will write this down. Volume of the tube or radius r along x equals omega m r to the m times something plus omega m plus 1 r to the m plus 1 times something plus, and the last term is omega n r to the n times something. I mean, just remember the structure. So, it's a polynomial. Now, what could be this thing? Let's do a, a, a naive computation. So, if you want to comp if you want to compute, uh, if you want to, am I doing it right? Wrong. It starts at co-dimension. That's is very important, and ends at n minus co-dimension, and ends at and ends at n. Excuse me. This is good. C plus one. I apologize, this is very important. So it's a polynomial that starts at lowest degree is co-dimension, and the highest degree is uh, the dimension of the ambient space. So let's see, how do we, how would you go naively about computing the volume of a tube? Well, you first you move a, a disk of a ball of radius r around your manifold. So the first approximation will be the volume of a manifold times the volume of a disk of complementary direction. So the coefficient here will be the volume of your manifold x. But then there are corrections. And these corrections are, this is what Hermann Weil discovered. Notice, first of all, the volume of the tube is an extrinsic quantity because it depends on how the manifold sits in the ambient space. The remarkable discovery of Hermann Weil is that all these coefficients are intrinsic. So let's look at the theorem. Uh, so we have, we have these, uh, the volume is a polynomial of the type I just wrote. Now, uh, mu m minus k uh, is zero if k is odd. So for example, if a x is a five dimensional manifold, uh, mu four is gonna be odd, mu two is gonna be zero. So for a, for a four-dimensional manifold, for a, a five-dimensional manifold x, you will get mu five, you will get mu three, and you'll get mu one. The others will disappear. That's just a fact, follows by simple symmetry. That's the easiest part. The hard part is that uh, mu m, if you go down an even number of steps, oh, sorry, um, mu m minus 2h is a universal polynomial of degree h in the curvature integrated against the volume density of the manifold. Now, that is easy to say because whatever the integral you get there is going to be invariant under the orthogonal group. So th this qualitative st statement is easy to conclude. 
What he did, he did much more, he identified these polynomials using his theory of invariance. So he said, if it's an invariant, it has to have this form and got a universal description and then tested it against when x is a unit sphere in something or some sphere and he identified the coefficients. And what happened? Um, the description is complicated. But here's a description I learned from probabilists, which is so much easier. So the curvature, the curvature is a um, two-form with coefficients skew-symmetric and domorphism of the tangent bundle. Yeah, we know that. It's uh, R X Y for two tangent vector. R X Y is a uh, an is skew-symmetric and domorphism of the tangent bundle. Now. The skew symmetric endomorphisms can be identified. Oh, sorry. Can be identified with two forms in this in the usual way. If you give me uh, a skew symmetric endomorphism, this is the two form associated to it. Okay. Now, in some places, A is put on, on the other in the other side and you get an overall negative sign and if you do that you get a different story so 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 there are many many choices there now doing this i can view the curvature as an element in this tensor product okay good so now a little bit of the linear algebra digression uh, we look at the space of biforms. Uh, lambda PQ is lambda PQ of a vector space tensor lambda Q. It's a, just a natural construction. And we have a wedge product uh, defined in, the, in this natural uh, fashion. This is good. And um, now, if U has a metric on it, it induces uh, metrics on the exterior powers. And now we have a trace operator on lambda p p. If you give me uh, a p p form alpha tensor beta, is just the inner product of alpha and beta. If you like, uh, lambda p p using the metric can be identified with a space of endomorphism of lambda p, and it's a genuine trace. So uh, we have lambda p p of u equals lambda p u tensor lambda p u. Using the metric on lambda p, I can identify this with this dual. And this is the same as endomorphisms of lambda p u. And as such, they have a trace. But the identification is, comes through the metric, so that's another possible definition. So here's the, <coughs> here's the, the definition of um, this universal polynomial okay? that appears in, that appears in, uh, uh, in the, the tube formula. So here are some examples. Uh, mu m. Oh, sorry, I, I can't, I don't can. Mu M, the top degree curvature measure, I should say that this is curvature measure or Lipschitz killing curvature of, of X, is the volume. You go down, you go, you go down uh, two, you get, that's the uh, curvature measure, and you recognize the Einstein functional. Uh, if you go down, way down, if x is even dimensional, dimension 2h, you go down 2h, mu 0, mu 0 is going to be the last term that you see here, is, if you integrate mu 0 of x, you get the Euler characteristic of x. Why is that? That's, if x were orientable, that would be the Fafian. That would be the Fafian of the curvature. 
but if it's not orientable, it's still order characteristic. So this is a Gauss Bonnet for embedded manifolds, where we do not need we do not need uh, orientability uh, conditions to to state. So notice this is you, you can see the 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 uh, two formula as a sort of explicit Taylor expansion for the volume, where the, the first term is the one that comes to mind, uh, is the, the volume of uh, the sum manifold times the volume of the normal disk. But then you get higher degree, higher degree corrections, and the last one is purely topological. <laughs> so, if you have a surface, if you have a surface uh, in a, a vector space, the volume of the tube is going to be, it, it will involve the volume of the surface and the Euler characteristic of the surface. That's going to be the complete. I mean, uh, historically, let me just say, uh, the first two formula were, were for curves. I forgot, he, uh, I, I forgot the name of the, person is a German mathematician statistician and you observe that the volume of a tube in our you take a knot in Rn in R3 you take a tube around it so everybody was betting that if you take the volume of a tube the curvature of the knot will have to appear in some way and it didn't it was a it was a pretty shocking result it doesn't appear so this is what prompted um, uh, Hermann Weil to look to, under, to understand this better. Okay, now if you have a three-dimensional uh, manif some manifold, this is the complete formula for the volume, and the, the next correction is given by the Einstein function. Good. Now, uh, so we have these, we have these things. We have these things. We have defined, we have defined these measures, mu m x, mu m minus one x, uh, mu k x. Okay. But they are defined in, in um, uh, these are going to be, this is, uh, this is going to be zero, but um, um, just because of smoothness. Now, let me explain the role of those indices. They're not random. Uh, if you measure distance in meters, this quantity is measured in meters to the power m, meaning rescaled by a factor of k. This changes by a factor of k to the m. Uh, m minus 2 changes by a factor of uh, m minus 2, and you can see why. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at the Einstein functional, the volume is measured in meters to the power m, and the scalar curvature is measured in meters to the power negative 2. Think of it this way. If you dilate a manifold, you're decreasing the curvature. It becomes flatter and flatter. So that's, that's the idea. And because here you, you can see clearly uh, the curvature de decreases by, a f if you dilate by a factor of t, curvature decreases by a factor of t minus 2. And if you raise it to those powers, you, you get this scaling conditions. In particular, mu0 is a-dimensional, which is normal, it's a Euler characteristic, a topological invariant. Okay. Good. I will... Now, I want to... It turns out this is the better definition. This is the better definition uh, for the curvature measure.
using those forms that I described before. Those forms are rather special. So remember, these forms r live on the unit sphere bundle of the tangent bundle of uh, V. Yeah, they live there. And the group, the orthogonal group, acts on the unit tangent bundle. And you look at the space of forms of degree n minus 1, which are orthogonally invariant. This space is very small, and these forms, k0, k1, kn minus 1, form a basis of the space. Okay, so the, the invariance under the orthogonal group is manifested in this. And the indices refer to various um, rescaling properties. So now here's what I want to do. I, I haven't written in these notes, but let me draw a picture. Let me draw a picture. So here's x. And well, this is uh, the unisphere of um, Tx perp. Okay. And you, you have to do some editing. <laughs> Even Lawrence Olivier needed a couple of takes <laughs> to get it right. <laughs> so, so we have the unit. You, we have the unit uh, normal bundle, and we have uh, the manifold here. And if we have a subset U in X, I have. Let me call U hat the pullback there. Okay. And now I can define mu j of u, the measure of the subset in here, to be the integral over u hat kappa j. Okay. And these things satisfy the inclusion-exclusion principles. So they are like measures, meaning I'm saying mu j of u intersect v is mu u cup v is mu j of u plus mu j of v minus mu j of u intersect v. So they're like a measure, like a counting measure. So they're like finally additive, finally additive measures on the manifold x. And the total measure of x, uh, the, curva to the Lipschitz killing curvature of x, is the total measure of x. And I'm interested in these locally, uh, in these finally additive objects to later on. They carry a bit more information than, than um, the whole thing. Okay, so let me, I, that's, I, I don't want to write. Here are the canonical forms in low dimensions, okay? Uh, so if I choose polar coordinates, r and theta, in the normal direction, here's k0. So k0 plays the role of angular form, and this is what Bot likes to call it, and uh, if, if you work in general, uh, K0 restricted to the unit uh, normal bundle is, in the words of Bot, a global angular form. Because the integral over everything is going to be the volume. Okay? And the other, uh, kappa 1, you see it there. So theta refers to. Uh, 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 polar coordinates in the fiber. Here's in, uh, here are the results in three dimensions. And I hopefully you get to see, hopefully you get to see there's a certain reproducing uh, property for these forms. I mean, they kind of resembled, they kind of resemble the, the guys in dimension two uh, a little bit. Here, uh, here's that. Uh, 
So this is the global angular form, that's it, on, in dimension 3. But these ones look like what we've encountered in dimension 1, and but we add an extra monomial, and we use a substitution. I, so there is this reproducing uh, property of these forms, and this these reproducing property is related to a reproducing property for these curvature measures. Okay, that's Crofton formula. Good, so let me talk about Crofton formula, which are itself very, very beautiful. So, uh, let me denote by graph C of V uh, to be the Grassmannian of affine planes of co-dimension C. Okay? Uh, so I'm not going to write this. And graph K of V, the Grassmannians of k-dimensional subspaces in V. Okay? So, what is Crofton formula? Uh, is, well, uh, you do a, an MRI for, for, the, for the manifold X. You start slicing it with, with all the hyperplanes, or all the affine planes possible. You collect some information from the intersection and yeah, how do you globalize this to get something out of it? Okay. So, let me explain a little bit the structure of this. Of this um, uh, there is a natural map. There's a natural map from uh, affine subspaces of co-dimension C to vector spaces of dimension C. If you take me, uh, if you give me L, uh, let me be very, let me be very specific here. It's co-dimension. If you give me, if you give me a affine subspace, I'll, I'll give you its parallel. The one go through the origin. You translate it to the origin. Now, so here's the, here's the picture. So here is the. Let's start in R two. This is L. This is L perp. Now. Uh, how many affine planes have the same uh, L uh, parallel? Well, it's L perp. The, let me denote, let me denote, let me say L is uniquely determined by it's parallel to the origin, and it's centered, which is defined as L intersect with L parallel perp. So in, in terms of pictures, let me, let me draw this better. So here's the space, here's L. Here's L parallel, here's L parallel perp, and here's the center. Okay. Now, what, what, this is, what this is saying is this is uh, the total space of a uh, vector bundle over this grass money. What vector bundle? Well, the quotient tautological quotient bundle and say it's so it's the it's the vector bundle over the grassmannian whose fiber is the orthogonal complement of the tautological m bundle it, we call this the quotient bundle i think that's how it's called in algebraic geometry 
But the point is, the point is, it, it is uh, the total space, the total space, uh, the gra graph C is the total space of a vector bundle. Now, this gadget, the Grassmannian, well, it's a symmetric space. It, it, it's uh, invariant under the orthogonal group. And in particular, because the orthogonal group acts transitively, there exists up to a multiplicative constant a unique invariant measure. Okay? So now, to do the, for the computation to come out nice, you need to normalize this measure. This is a very clever uh, normalization due to Giancarlo Rota that, that just minimizes, I mean, all the constants become one. It's very clever, so I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through that. Okay, so I will define these uh, numbers. It's called flag coefficients. They're called flag coefficients by Giancarlo Roda. And the normalization is I pick the invariant measure so that the uh, total measure of the Grassmannian is this number. Okay, Just, I'll keep that. Now, I can define a m density on the total space, and I'll explain to, I will not say it locally, I'll describe what, it, what does it mean to integrate on affine Grassmannians. The integral of a function on affine Grassmannian goes as follows. First, you integrate along the fiber. How do you integrate? The fiber is a vector space in V. It has a canonical Lebesgue measure. So you integrate along the fiber, and you get a function on uh, the regular Grassmannian, and then you integrate with respect to that. So I did that with uh, sophomores who didn't know integrals, didn't know manifolds. Believe me, they could compute integrals like there's no tomorrow. Really, they could do this. Finally, when they got to back to their schools, they found out what is a manifold and what is an integral. But they knew how to do it. So the Crofton formula says as follows. Um, let's slice x with uh, uh, planes of co-dimension k. Okay? And then take the p measure of the slice. Yes. So if you do that, then the average, if you like, if you add the piece, the, the p volumes of the slices, you will get a curvature measure of x. Well, it's mu p, but is increased by, by k. Why is it called reproducing formula? Because I can use a mu p to deduce a measure that has a larger index. I mean, the most extreme case, this is the sort of the original Crofton formula. Um, if you integrate, if you slice those co-dimension k planes, and all that you re retain is the Euler characteristic of the slice, you're going to get the k-dimensional curvature measure of x. So what this says is these curvature measures are determined essentially topologically from uh, Euler characteristic, which is a eminently additive quantity, and a little bit of averaging. Okay, that's all you need. So let's look at one example. That, that's Crofton's original formula, where I take x to be a curve in R two, and I slice it with a. a Let's see what I'm trying to do. So we, we start with the curve in R2. And I slice it with co-dimension 1 planes, which is our lines. The intersection between a line and a curve in R2 is a bunch of points, typically. So the Euler characteristic is the number of points. So now I'm looking at the average of the number of intersection of the curve with a line. And I'm integrating. I mean, I do this computation, and here what it is. Half the average of number intersection is the length of the curve. That's 
That's Crofton original formula. So in other words, here's how you can compute. This is what I call a uh, MRI. You slice it many, many times. What you're doing is you're doing a Riemann sum for this integral. So you take many, many lines that, that's just roughly uniform distributed in a space of lines and um, form the Riemann sum and that ought to be very close to the, the, uh, the, the uh, length of the curve. That's roughly. Now, this is not a probability measure, but the curve being compact, lines that are far away will not intersect. So you're really integrating on a compact set of lines. Okay. Good. Now, I, we can take this as a definition for a curvature measure for any compact set. You can do that. For any compact set, you define this integral. This is going to be, this is going to be uh, a finally additive measure. Just because the Euler characteristic, if your sets are not too bad, you have some excision properties, is satisfy Euler characteristic of A union B is Euler characteristic of A plus B minus. So this is a this is a, a possible. This is a possible uh, approach to define measure, but then it's, it's very hard to go very far. Now, uh, Federer extended this, uh, this story to sets of positive reach. So what is a set of positive reach? It's a set, so there's a small number r, so if you are within r of your set, there's a unique closest point. So convex sets are sets of positive reach. Maybe they could be non-singular, could be singular. Some smooth sum manifolds are sets of positive reach. But if you look at an angle, just one of the simplest singular sets, an angle in the plane, that doesn't have positive reach. Because if you look at a bisecting line, they are too close to this point. So uh, now the theory was uh, worked out by Joseph Fu, and he worked very, very generally with sets that have uh, like next to nothing. But then the work is just totally miserable, and then the results are true only for sets that have some property. So let me say his work is really impressive. It, uh, every little step is uh, mm, tremendous work in geometric measuring just because he was trying to make it very general. So now, if you work with a more reasonable class of sets, that can be simplified dramatically. And when I mean dramatically, it's one, one fifth, one twentieth of, of what he's done. So what I want to do next time is describe a nice class of singular sets. I mean, these, this class was discovered by logicians and uh, has to do with this all minimal structures. Let me say, for geometers, this is a dream come true. Everything you want is there, and it's very general. Anything, any set that you can produce in a finite number of, of steps will be in this category. Now, you may not have cast and handles and these things that involve infinite infinite uh, procedures. You may, uh, Hawaiian rings are not going to be there. But anything you can project on a board, meaning it's produced by an algorithm in a finite time, it's going to be there. And uh, the theory is truly, really, it works beautifully in that case. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Yes. Um, can, so, so how many how many terms do you have for a knot in free space, and what is it, what is the coefficient? Yeah. So you're asking how many terms for the two formula for knots in R three. Yeah. There's only one term. Only one term. And and, and what's the mu for that? 
uh, is the the it's length of the, the length, yeah. That's always that first yeah gotcha. yeah gotcha. yeah, okay. yeah. Right. now the situation changes if you work with um, manifolds with boundary you're going to get something involving the second fundamental form of the boundary but it's still intrinsic in in a sense that will describe um, it, let me say that the secret to generalizing is having a nice class of uh, singular sets. And fortunately, these were discovered. And then Moore's theory. It's just remarkable. And if you put nice singular sets with stratify Moore's theory, and you stick in there the Legendrian condition, there's only one answer. And that's remarkable.